Hello and welcome to Church at Home. My name is Piero, I am part of the staff here at Maybridge Community Church. If you are new to us or trying us out online for the first time, if you stumbled across our YouTube videos, it's really great to have you with us and we really hope you enjoy exploring faith online with us this, today. If you are viewing us via the Church Online platform, do get stuck in with the chat and say hello, send prayers, encouragements. It's great to know that we're not watching alone and that we're part of this online community as well. This week, we're taking a pause on our Radical King series. We've been taking a look through the Gospel of Matthew slowly, uh, but our Senior Minister, Matt, is going to be talking to us about how we belong as a church, how we sign up and get involved with what God is doing uh, through our church, through our vision and our mission. And that we talk about partnership quite a lot at Maybridge. And so that's coming up this week as well as our usual worship uh, for singing. If you would like to give as part of your worship this week, uh, you can do so by scanning the QR code, which will have appeared on the screen or uh, if you, that's if you have the gift app, but if you don't, you can head to maybridge.org.uk forward slash give to do so. But if you are uh, not a regular part of Maybridge Community Church, please don't feel any uh, pressure to give. This is a way that as Christians, we like to support the work of our church uh, and all the activities that it does in and through the community. So let's kick off with some worship. It's a new horizon. 
Well, hi, I'm Matt, one of the leaders at Maybridge. Lovely to have you with us online. Now, we're pausing our normal teaching series for a couple of weeks. As for a number of years now, partnership is the word that we've used to describe what it looks like to be committed to Maybridge as a church. And there's loads of good thinking and reasoning behind that. And what happened used to be that every January we'd have what was called Partnership Month, where we'd talk about what it meant and there was a chance to re-sign up for another year. Now, we haven't done that for about two and a half years now because... As leaders we, leaders, we decided to step back and review the church's vision and therefore what partnership meant. And then the pandemic happened, so it wouldn't have worked to really do it all practically. And we've concluded that September is a better of time of year to do it. And so today and next Sunday, we're going to talk about what partnership at Maybridge means for the future. You may or may not know that our values as a church are we do life together, we get stuck in, we're here for you, and we're all about Jesus. But our vision, the thing we're trying to do, is to build a vibrant church community that resolutely follows Jesus and extravagantly shares the goodness of God. That's not just been pulled out of the air. In a sense, these are the sort of things that every church that follows Jesus should really be about. And most churches will say this with their own words and their own ways. You see, this derives from some words that Jesus said himself. Right at the end of Matthew's Gospel, it closes with a few verses and they're just incredible. This is right after Jesus has died and then miraculously risen again. The most important event in history has just happened. Everyone who knows about it is reeling. But after this, Jesus meets with his disciples, his group of immediate followers, a number of times, and then he leaves. The plan was not for Jesus to physically stick around. And then right, right, right before he goes, Jesus tells his followers what he wants them to do. And this, if you've never looked at this, it may surprise you. The last thing Jesus says before he goes is not love everybody more. It's not be good until I come back. It's not go and do loads of churchy stuff. It's not even read the Bible every day. And those things are not bad, obviously, but they're not what Jesus says right at the end. This is what Matthew tells us about Jesus' last words. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is what Jesus told his followers to get on with. And what I'm going to do today is break this down almost word by word, because you can miss quite a lot of how huge this is, and, and people have a lot of misconceptions about it too. Firstly, it gives the context from verse 16. It says the eleven disciples went to Galilee where Jesus told them when they saw him they worshipped but some doubted. Now think about this. There were eleven disciples when there had originally been twelve. Well, Why is that? Well because one of them, Judas, had betrayed Jesus completely. He was gone. That's a real downer. And it's a little reminder that it wasn't all plain sailing up to this point. But the eleven that are left meet Jesus on this mountain and they worship. They've come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And yet Matthew doesn't make this sound like some 
great moment where everything clicked. He tells us, some doubted. These people have literally seen Jesus come back from the dead with their own eyes, and yet there was still doubt. It certainly makes me feel better about some of my doubts. But when Jesus says what he says, he doesn't say it when the disciples are at their best. That They're dealing with all sorts of emotions and confusion. They are not pillars of unswerving faith in this moment. And yet Jesus still chooses this moment to give them a job that will change the world. A job for normal people. So that's the context. Then it says Jesus came to them and said, All authority on hev- on heaven and, uh, on, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We might be a bit desensitised to it because it's Jesus and it's the Bible. But what a claim! Jesus, not long before this, was executed for blasphemy according to the laws of the land. And these words would have been seen by the religious authorities in exactly the same way. Only now Jesus has shown he can beat death. So, you know, what are they going to do? But nobody else talks like this. Jesus does not say he has some of the authority or a bit of authority or even a lot of authority. He says all authority. He's God. He's ultimately in charge of everything. He owns everything. Every detail of your life from birth to death happens under his authority. And what this means is we should really listen to him. And this may seem like the most obvious thing, but even lots of well-intentioned Christians will tell you things and emphasise things in life and prioritise things that are different from what Jesus says. We get caught up in all sorts of stuff. We have, we have preferences. But all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to him. So what is it he asks of us? This is what Jesus asks his disciples, them and us, to do. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. That's one sentence, but someone once described this as the greatest vision with the greatest scope ever given by the greatest person who ever lived. Because of that, I'm just going to word by word go through it, because there's so much in it, and you need all of it to make sense of it. Firstly, Jesus says, therefore. So because of what he's just said, his supreme authority disciples of him must be made and the command carries the authority of God himself. This is not advice from a religious sage, it's a command from God Almighty. Then he says go. Those who follow Jesus need to be proactive. Making disciples doesn't happen passively. The call is take the initiative, get off your sofa, put in the time. And going might mean going next door to the next street, the next town, or like Phil and Shirley recently did, moving to Ipswich, Or it might be moving to another country, which a number of people at Maybridge have done in order to be part of what Jesus says in these verses. And if that's you, then thank you for being a wonderful example. And then it says, and make. It's really important this bit is in here because we need to understand what's God's responsibility and what's ours. It's very easy to think, well, my faith is private. I'll just sort of get on with it over here. Or to do the opposite and worry about, am I doing enough to change the world? You know, what am I doing enough things? But elsewhere, Jesus says, I will build my church. Jesus builds the worldwide church on a large scale, it's above our pay grade, but he tells us to make disciples. He gives us responsibility, not more than we can take, but he definitely gives us work to do. And so it's not presumptuous or arrogant to seek to influence others more towards Jesus. God dignifies us with a big part to play in his plan for the world. But what's exciting is that we will find success, as God measures it, in this if we give ourselves to it. Jesus would not ask us to do something that that didn't work. When we focus our efforts on making disciples, we'll see the fruit of that, even if it takes a while, because when we do it, we are in line with what God is doing. The next word is disciples, one of the key words in the passage. What is a disciple? Lots of Christians read these verses and think the call to make disciples is is about evangelism. It's about talking to people who are not Christians, and then we all feel bad because we don't see ourselves as gifted evangelists and we don't really do it very much. Don't worry, sharing our faith with people is important and it's part of this, but there's loads more. Jesus doesn't say make converts, he says make disciples. Now in modern Hebrew, there are two words for learners, studentim and talmidim. Studentim is obviously from the English, studentim are are academic learners, people who are in the classroom reading, studying, making notes. That's not what disciples are. Disciples are talmidim. Being talmidim is more like vocational training, learning on the job, being an apprentice. And in Jewish culture, Talmidim are devoted to their teacher, their rabbi, in all things. They're trying to apply their instruction to every bit of life. And that's what we're supposed to do with Jesus. And this means disciples aren't just people who call themselves Christians 
or people who have just a really good theological education or they've done a degree or something, they are doers. A great example of this will be the, dif- be the difference in what I did at university and what my wife did at university. I did a degree in English and religious studies, and so I went to lectures you know, sometimes, and uh, I learned some stuff, and then I had essays and exams to do, and I can't remember most of it now because it really doesn't have a lot to do with my daily life. Naomi, on the other hand, did a medical degree. Now, that involved some classroom stuff. You know, you need to know human biology and stuff about drugs. But most of it was practical because that's the whole point. A more experienced doctor would show the younger doctors how to do the job. And then the younger doctors would have a go with supervision and encouragement. And eventually they'd go out on their own. And and now Naomi can train younger doctors herself. Everything she learned was practical and still gets used every day when she's at work now. When Jesus says make disciples, he's saying make Talmudim. That means it's not enough for someone like me to stand here and talk about the Bible every week. It's hopefully useful, but it's like the classroom bit of Naomi's degree. We need it, but it's not the whole thing. For us to make disciples, we need to help each other work out how to follow Jesus in real life, how to pray, how to serve people well, how to make good decisions with money, how to raise children. It's the way of Jesus in the whole of life. It's also both the internal and the external stuff. It's spiritual disciplines like prayer and taking a Sabbath and retreat and dwelling, things on, the, dwelling on things in the Bible and, and character change. We'll talk more about these next week. But it's also using your resources well and caring for the poor and sick and being active in your community and resisting evil and speaking up against bad things. We can't afford to emphasise just the internal or just the external. We all probably prefer one or the other, but it has to be both. And Jesus says this is of all nations. If what Jesus had just said didn't sound big enough, he tells us to make disciples of all nations. It's the Greek word ethne, it literally means every ethnicity. When Jesus said this to 11 young blokes on a mountain in the middle of the first century, this probably sounded ridiculous. And they didn't even know about loads of the world that has been discovered since. Plus, there are far more people in the world now. These 11 guys couldn't possibly have carried this out in their lifetimes, which is one reason we know this command is for everybody who has followed Jesus since. But 2,000 years later, a massive chunk of the world claimed to be Christians, and in the next few decades, it's very possible that every people group in the world will have an indigenous Christian presence. It takes time, but when people get on with what Jesus says, he honours it. And so every Christian, every disciple, is called to participate in the global scope of Jesus' commission. Many people have physically relocated to be part of it, learn languages, translate Bibles, put their own comforts to one side to make disciples in a culture that's not their own. That's incredible. We don't all need to go international, but we're all meant to have a stake in it. Giving, praying, supporting those who go and do. But more than that, this should shape how we relate to people of different ethnic or national backgrounds. When Jesus said these words, everyone thought he was the, the Jewish guy for Jewish people to be understood in a Jewish way. And in this, Jesus says, well, no, I'm actually for everybody. You can't look at anyone from any background the same way ever again. When I was a teenager, I lived in a town that had a very high population of Pakistani origin people. And two families in our church did a house swap. One moved because they didn't want to live with all their neighbours being Pakistani. The other moved the other way because they wanted to be embedded amongst the Pakistani people so they could represent Jesus to them. Which family had it right? I think the second one, because if you take Jesus seriously, everything about how you see people from other cultures needs to change. It's more than simply trying not to be racist. It's loving to learn about other people and cultures and seeing yourself as a servant, even of the most despised or marginalised ethnicity, because God loves them and you're meant to represent Jesus to them. Then Jesus says of the disciples that we make, we're to be baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When people become disciples, they're meant to be baptised. And the word for this meant immersed. So baptising people when they come to personal faith is important, but it also reminds us that all this happens in community. When people get baptised, they make a public declaration about following Jesus to the community they live in. It's not that one person goes over here and does some disciple making, and it's got nothing to do with wider community. Disciples are baptised in the name of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. As Christians, we believe that God is mysteriously somehow three and yet one. And in a sense, he's a community of persons and he's a person at the same time. Hard thing. But what Jesus says here underlines that when a person becomes a disciple, this is what they join in with, what they participate in. 
But it doesn't stop there. As a community, when we see a person come to faith in Jesus and get baptised, it's wonderful. But the temptation is to think, job done. Well, no, it's only just started. Look at Jesus' next words and teaching them. Disciples help make us help people all the way through the journey. We're called to actively teach the ways of Jesus to others. That's everything from the sort of thing we're doing right now, to conversations with kids in the car, to online courses, to praying with someone, to talking through hard things, to demonstrating how to sacrificially love people. Teaching takes on so many different forms. None of us is good at all of them. Again, communities of disciples make disciples, not individuals. But all of this teaching has a purpose, which is, <clears throat> Jesus says, to obey. To obey. Now, obeying is nobody's favourite concept, but Jesus wants us to obey what he says. Not because he's on a power trip, he has all authority anyway, and he died for us, so it's hard to say that this is all about controlling people. No, Jesus wants to, us to obey him for our good. But all the things we teach about him and what he says have a, have a point that, that is that we obey, that we actually do them in real life. Sometimes people approach me and say, oh, great sermon today, Matt, great message. Doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does. And it's lovely when people say that, but the point is, did you hear something about Jesus that you're actually going to obey? I can stand here, other people can stand here and, and talk about stuff all day long, but does it change anything in your life? It's not that if everyone knows all the right stuff, we'll all be okay. If we've got good theology and robust doctrine, great. But that's not what Jesus is asking here. What he says is meant to be obeyed. Whenever we talk about the Bible at Maybridge, the point is to be practical. If it's not practical, we don't do it. We're wasting our time. And the next word Jesus says is everything. We're meant to obey everything. I think we're often good at following the bits of Jesus' teaching that we like the most. But everything reminds us that we're supposed to take on the whole lot and make sure we teach the full range of his commands to others, not just our preferred ones. So it might be worth asking, do you know what Jesus commands? Do you actually know? You, you can't obey what you don't know. If you read Matthew's Gospel alone, Jesus commands loads of stuff. And by commands, it's not just rules, it's, it's patterns and rhythms for life. It's, it's how to handle everyday situations. The Sermon on the Mount alone covers heart attitudes, marriage and divorce, making good commitments, loving enemies, being generous, handling anxiety, judging people, how to pray. Elsewhere, Jesus talks about rest, how to speak to people well, how to trust God, how to be clean, how to be great, how to forgive. This is why we're slowly working through Matthew's Gospel as a church over a few years. It puts us in touch with what Jesus commands every week. And so the aim is not to cherry pick our favourite bits, but to know and obey everything Jesus says. In fact, he calls it everything I have commanded you. Jesus doesn't give advice, he gives commands. Everything the disciples have seen, everything they've been told, is to be passed on. And it's only because people did that, they obeyed that, that you and I are listening to this today. All Jesus' commands were passed on and passed on and passed on through generations, and that's why we're here now. It's incredible. Different churches and denominations and groups emphasise all sorts of different things. We've all got our own emphases. But according to Jesus, this is what it's about, teaching people of every race and tribe and tradition to obey what he has commanded. So I wonder, looking over these verses, if anybody's feeling a bit intimidated by the intensity of this, feels quite heavy. I will get more practical next week, but don't worry, when people invited all of his people, when Jesus invited all of his people to make disciples, he did so knowing our limits and weaknesses. He knows who he's working with. And I believe, and have experienced, even the most incompetent person can be used powerfully to make disciples, because God blesses it when people get on with doing what he said. But you need to know that right after Jesus says this hard and challenging stuff, he says something else designed to reassure us, because let, let's face it, we need reassuring. I mean, making disciples of the whole world, I'm not sure I can do a good job of making disciples of my kids. They run rings around me. But the thing, next thing Jesus says is, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is constantly present. He's with us to the end of the world. That's the ultimate reassurance we need. But look at the moment in which he says it. It's when we get on with disciple making that Jesus is tangibly with us, I would argue, because we're living in his purposes. If you're investing in other people, helping them move forward, making personal sacrifices to get alongside people, having to deal with the practicalities of, of living it all out, that's when you will most deeply feel his presence, because he loves it when we do that. There is no question that as God's people focus on making disciples, God shows up. 
And if you sort of zoom out from these verses and look at everything we've seen today, it's all in a promise sandwich. And it looks something like this. Firstly, Jesus says, I'm supremely powerful. And lastly, he says, in a sense, I'm intimately present. And in the middle of that, the filling is when he says, go and make disciples. Jesus makes promises about his power and his presence either side of the big challenge. Now, if you're going to do something huge and a bit scary, seemingly, what you want more than anything is some assurance that God is both powerful and present. Now think of this. If you move in what I would call more conservative church circles, there's a big emphasis on the sovereignty of God, the idea that God is supreme over all things. And that's true, and we should talk about that. In what I would call more charismatic church circles, there's a big emphasis on the presence of God, that he's imminent, he's with us now, and he can be known and experienced. And that's true too. The place where Jesus emphasises both of these things is right here. God's power and presence are experienced when we throw ourselves into his purposes. And so Jesus really does give the greatest challenge with the greatest scope, but it's wrapped up with the greatest promises. And I'm talking about all this in a day when we're thinking through what it means to be part of Maybridge Community Church, to be a, a church partner. Now, why is that? Well, here are some thoughts. And let me just say that this week, we are talking about the church as a whole. We'll get personal ne next week, and I'll tell you some of my own story when it comes to making disciples and how each person has a role. But two things for the whole church, and this is important. Please think about this and, and pray on this. Firstly, the purpose of church is to make disciples. I know that's quite a strong thing to say because people talk about church in all sorts of ways. But if you really boil it down, I would argue if you look at what Jesus says, I can't see a better way of understanding the point of church. We're here to make disciples. And there's a lot of implications to that. But it means we need to organise ourselves so that we do it as well as possible. Everything from the songs we choose to what small groups look like to what community projects we do, how we set up the rooms we meet in, how long the message is on a Sunday. Everything should be decided based on how it best helps us make disciples. Not meet as many people's preferences as possible, not doing what's easiest, but making disciples. I recently read a fantastic quote by a man called Alan Hirsch, and if you haven't heard of him, Alan Hirsch is a world-renowned expert on churches and how churches grow and so on. And someone said to him, look, if you could go back to the start, clean slate in your life, how would you go about church now? And this is what he said, he made a number of points, he said, I'd focus the whole deal on Jesus and make sure it stays focused there and ensure that we actually make disciples who make disciples all the way down the line. I would practice incarnational forms of mission, in other words, people engaging with people in real life. He said, I would seek to minister as part of a dynamically equipped team with varied gifts and church. I'd work to build a low control, high accountability culture and I'd seek to create a culture that takes godly risks and has adventures together in community. I love this because I think he's spot on. It's very easy to get stuck into doing churchy stuff the way it's always been and, and not step back and think about what we're actually trying to do and why. And to paraphrase Hirsch, a church that is serious about making disciples, focuses on Jesus, takes the long view, gets practical, relies on teamwork, releases people to do stuff and takes intelligent risks. Who wants to be part of a church like that? Who wouldn't want to be part of a church like that? Well, second thing, Maybridge Community Church is about being and making disciples. Maybridge has a great heritage. Many of you have been part of things in this church for a long time and done lots of wonderful stuff. We have a history of being a church that's particularly known, I would say, for strong teaching and great work in the community. And I really hope those continue. But the overarching thing is that we need to be a church that makes disciples. You might know that our building, 77 The Strand, has been used by the local council as a children and family centre for the last number of years. And that partnership is going to end soon because of various government things going on. And it's sad, but it, it does give us a new opportunity. How do we use that resource to bless our community? What if it was a place where people were coming in all the time, day after day, and experiencing love and practical support and being given a taste of what God is like? There's loads of work to do on it. I'm glad to tell you Becky Davis is chairing a team of people who are working through what it will look like in the next few months. But speak to me or anyone in leadership if you've got thoughts and ideas or you've prayed over it and you see God leading into something. It's a remarkable opportunity we have. Even in the summer just gone, with everything sort of settling down post-pandemic, we had 50 kids from the local community pile into the holiday club. It was amazing. The Bags of Hope projects ran in the holidays. And even in that short window, for a few hours a week, dozens of people came in 
got free food, but there was also a relational connection. People loved being there. People brought friends. And that's just the beginning of what it could be. But it's all in service of following what Jesus said about making disciples. It's not just being nice. It's pointing it unashamedly to him. And this has to shape how we meet on Sundays too. At the moment, we have three services at two locations, plus church online like this. And each thing is very different. And and that's a good thing. But One thing that's been very clear, especially on the back of the pandemic, is that people crave small community. that, That heart desire to be known, to be part of something where you're known and needed. Can we organise ourselves in a way that better helps us make disciples? I think we can. Imagine this. Imagine as the movement continues towards people being all back at in-person church. Imagine if instead of having just a big service at 10.30 every week, along with our other other two at the 77th Strand, imagine if we met in congregations of 50 to 80 at the Strand every week. Now, if that happened very quickly, the people in each congregation would get to know each other pretty well. You'd notice if someone was away. You'd realise if someone was new to church. Out of necessity, people would be able to use their gifts and it it wouldn't just be a few people up at the front all the time. What if when we met together, we spent more time hearing about how people are living out what Jesus says in their workplace or in their family and being disciples in practice? What if we did that and each time we got to a certain number of people, we started a new congregation in a new location? And what if we still met as one church at the school once a month and had all the benefits we get from the energy and dynamism of a bigger gathering? Now, there's clearly loads of practical challenges to all this, but imagine how it would help us to grow the intimate communities that I think would help us grow as disciples of Jesus. Now, I can imagine even just raising this, there'll be lots of reactions and thoughts around it. Don't worry, it's not happening next week or anything. But I do think it's our direction of travel. There'll be plenty of opportunity to query and question and maybe even quibble in the months ahead. But we have to make decisions as a church based on what helps us to make disciples. That's the point. And so if you're up for being part of this, being and making disciples is the bottom line of what it means to be part of Maybridge going forward. Of course, anyone and everyone is more than welcome to attend whatever we do. But to be a church partner is to say, I want this. I want the commitment and the accountability and the benefits of throwing my lot in with these people who are serious about being and making disciples. Now in the past, whenever we've spoken about partnership, there's been an immediate chance to sign up, a bit of paper or something physically to say, yeah, I I want to be a Maybridge partner. And it's quite hard to do that online anyway, but we're still not going to do that today. We are going to do it, but not today. And the reason is, I want to ask you to think seriously about it, pray about it, chew on it. There's no punishment if you don't do it. It's not a mark of whether God loves you or anything. He does. It's simply a thing that's helpful for us as leaders to know who's on board with this journey. And it's helpful for each of us to have a fresh moment of saying before God, what does my being a disciple look like and who am I working on it with? Which community am I growing with and investing in? And next week, we'll think a bit more about what it personally means to help make disciples and be part of that effort, the the commission that God has given to us all. Let me pray. Father, thank you that Jesus already did the hard work. And every one of us is an inadequate disciple. We all get stuff wrong. And yet you dignify us, you gift us the work of being disciple makers. Now, firstly, we know we've got to be people who are disciples. And I pray you would grow us in that. But keep our eyes outward, please. In In the months and years ahead, morph us into a church of people that see themselves as disciple makers. Because we love following what Jesus says. We love responding to his commands because we know that he loves us. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us online. It's been great to do church together. If you uh, have any questions about anything that you've heard through the songs, through the talk this morning, we'd love for you to get in touch with us. And you can do so by visiting maybridge.org.uk forward slash contact. We'd love to share with you about things like our Alpha course that's coming up. Um, if you would like to explore questions about faith and uh, those big topics in life. Or if you're trying out Maybridge for the first time and would like to kind of get connected in, um, we've got a newcomers meal coming up as well. But do sign up uh, to our church emails, uh, to our newsletter that is, uh, comes out every Saturday morning, which has all the information and all the updates uh, that you could possibly need to know about everything that's going on in church family life. And don't forget that we'd also love to see you at one of our in-person services. That's at our breakfast church service at 77 The Strand, our 10.30 service at St Oscar Romero High School, or our 6pm service, again, back at 77 The Strand. Uh, until uh, we get to meet you face to face, we really hope you have a great week and we can't wait to see you soon.